You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 8 Departmental Kings of Nature. The preceding investigation has proved that the same union of sacred functions with a royal title which meets us in the King of the Wood at Nemi, the sacrificial king at Rome, and the magistrate called the King at Athens occurs frequently outside the limits of classical antiquity and is a common feature of societies at all stages, from barbarism to civilization. Further, it appears that the royal priest is often a king, not only in name, but in fact, swaying the scepter as well as the crozier. All this confirms the traditional view of the origin of the titular and priestly kings in the republics of ancient Greece and Italy, at least by showing that the combination of spiritual and temporal power, of which Greco-Italian tradition preserved the memory, has actually existed in many places— we have obviated any suspicion of improbability that might have attached to the tradition. Therefore, we may now fairly ask, may not the king of the wood have had an origin like that which a probable tradition assigns to the sacrificial king of Rome and the titular king of Athens? In other words, may not his predecessors in office have been a line of kings whom a republican revolution stripped of their political power, leaving them only their religious functions and the shadow of a crown? There are at least two reasons for answering this question in the negative. One reason is drawn from the abode of the priest of Nemi, the other from his title, the king of the wood. If his predecessors had been kings in the ordinary sense, he would surely have been found residing, like the fallen kings of Rome and Athens, in the city of which the scepter had passed from him. This city must have been Aresia, for there was none nearer. But Aresia was three miles off from his forest sanctuary by the lake shore. If he reigned, it was not in the city, but in the greenwood. Again, his title, King of the Wood, hardly allows us to suppose that he had ever been a king in the common sense of the word. More likely, he was a king of nature, and of a special side of nature, namely, the woods from which he took his title. If we could find instances of what we may call departmental kings of nature, that is, of persons supposed to rule over particular elements or aspects of nature, they would probably present a closer analogy to the king of the wood than the divine kings we have been hitherto considering, whose control of nature is general rather than special. Instances of such departmental kings are not wanting. On a hill at Boma, near the mouth of the Congo, dwells Namvulu Vumu, king of the rain and storm. Of some of the tribes on the upper Nile, we are told that they have no kings in the common sense. The only persons whom they acknowledge as such are the kings of the rain, Marakodu, who are credited with the power of giving rain at the proper time that is, the rainy season. Before the rains begin to fall at the end of March, the country is a parched and arid desert, and the cattle, which form the people's chief wealth, perish for lack of grass. So, when the end of March draws on, each householder betakes himself to the king of the rain and offers him a cow that he may make the blessed waters of heaven to drip on the brown and withered pastures. If no shower falls, the people assemble and demand that the king shall give them rain. And if the sky still continues cloudless, they rip up his belly, in which he is believed to keep the storms. Amongst the Bari tribe, one of these rain kings made rain by sprinkling water on the ground out of a handbell. Among tribes on the outskirts of Abyssinia, a similar office exists and has been thus described by an observer. The priesthood of the Alphi, as he is called by the Berea and Kunama, is a remarkable one. He is believed to be able to make rain. This office formerly existed among the Algeds and appears to still be common to the Nuba, 
the Alfai of Berea, who is also consulted by the northern Kunama, lives near Tembadir, on a mountain alone with his family. The people bring him tribute in the forms of clothes and fruits, and cultivate for him a large field of his own. He is a kind of king, and his office passes by inheritance to his brother or sister's son. He is supposed to conjure down rain, and to drive away the locusts. But if he disappoints the people's expectation, and a great drought arises in the land, the Alphi is stoned to death, and his nearest relations are obliged to cast the first stone at him. When we passed through the country, the office of Alphi was still held by an old man. But I heard that rain-making had proved too dangerous for him, and that he had renounced his office. In the backwoods of Cambodia live two mysterious sovereigns, known as the King of the Fire and the King of the Water. Their fame is spread all over the south of the great Indo-Chinese peninsula, but only a faint echo of it has reached the west. Down to a few years ago, no European, so far as is known, had ever seen either of them, and their very existence might have passed for a fable, were it not that, till lately, communications were regularly maintained between them and the king of Cambodia, who year by year exchanged presents with them. Their royal functions are of a purely mystic or spiritual order. They have no political authority. They are simple peasants living by the sweat of their brow and the offerings of the faithful. According to one account, they live in an absolute solitude, never meeting each other and never seeing a human face. They inhabit successively seven towers perched upon seven mountains, and every year they pass from one tower to another. People come furtively and cast within their reach what is needful for their subsistence. The kingship lasts seven years, the time necessary to inhabit all the towers successively, but many die before their time is out. The offices are hereditary in one or, according to others, two royal families, who enjoy high consideration, have revenues assigned to them, and are exempt from the necessity of tilling the ground. But naturally, the dignity is not coveted, and when a vacancy occurs, all eligible men, they must be strong and have children, flee and hide themselves. Another account, admitting the reluctance of the hereditary candidates to accept the crown, does not countenance the report of their hermit-like seclusion in the Seven Towers. For it represents the people as prostrating themselves before the mystic kings whenever they appear in public, it being thought that a terrible hurricane would burst over the country if this mark of homage were omitted. Like many other sacred kings, of whom we shall read in the sequel, the kings of fire and water are not allowed to die a natural death, for that would lower their reputation. Accordingly, when one of them is seriously ill, the elders hold a consultation, and if they think he cannot recover, they stab him to death. His body is burned, and the ashes are piously collected and publicly honored for five years." Part of them is given to the widow, and she keeps them in an urn, which she must carry on her back when she goes to weep on her husband's grave. We are told that the fire king, the more important of the two, whose supernatural powers have never been questioned, officiates at marriages, festivals, and sacrifices in honor of the yan, or spirit. On these occasions, a special place is set apart for him, and the path by which he approaches is spread with white cotton cloths. A reason for confining the royal dignity to the same family is that this family is in possession of certain famous talismans, which would lose their virtue or disappear if they passed out of the family. These talismans are three, the fruit of a creeper called Kui, gathered ages ago at the time of the last deluge, but still fresh and green, a rattan, also very old but bearing flowers that never fade, and lastly, a sword containing a yan, or spirit, who guards it constantly and works miracles with it. The spirit is said to be that of a slave, whose blood chanced to fall upon the blade while it was being forged, and who died a voluntary death to expiate his involuntary offense. By means of the two former talismans, the water king can raise a flood that would drown the whole earth. If the fire king draws the magic sword a few inches from its sheath, the sun is hidden and men and beasts fall into a profound sleep. Were he to draw it quite out of the scabbard, the world would come to an end. To this wondrous brand, sacrifices of buffaloes, pigs, fowls, and ducks are offered for rain. It is kept swathed in cotton and silk. 
and amongst the annual presents sent by the king of Cambodia, were rich stuffs to wrap the sacred sword. Contrary to the common usage of the country, which is to bury the dead, the bodies of both these mystic monarchs are burnt, but their nails and some of their teeth and bones are religiously preserved as amulets. It is while the corpse is being consumed by the pyre that the kinsmen of the deceased magician flee to the forest and hide themselves for fear of being elevated to the invidious dignity which he has just vacated. The people go and search for them, and the first whose lurking place they discover is made king of fire or water. These, then, are examples of what I have called departmental kings of nature. But it is a far cry to Italy from the forests of Cambodia and the sources of the Nile. And though kings of rain, water, and fire have been found, we have still to discover a king of the wood to match the Arician priest who bore that title. Perhaps we shall find him nearer home. Chapter 9. The Worship of Trees. Subsection 1. Tree Spirits. In the religious history of the Aryan race in Europe, the worship of trees has played an important part. Nothing could be more natural, for at the dawn of history, Europe was covered with immense primeval forests, in which the scattered clearings must have appeared like islets in an ocean of green. Down to the first century before our era, the Hercynian forest stretched eastward from the Rhine for a distance at once vast and unknown. Germans, whom Caesar questioned, had traveled for two months through it without reaching the end. Four centuries later, it was visited by the Emperor Julian, and the solitude, the gloom, the silence of the forest appear to have made a deep impression on his sensitive nature. He declared that he knew nothing like it in the Roman Empire. In our own country, the wields of Kent, Surrey, and Sussex are remnants of the great forest of Anderida, which once clothed the whole of the southeastern portion of the island. Westward, it seems to have stretched till it joined another forest that extended from Hampshire to Devon. In the reign of Henry the Second, the citizens of London still hunted the wild bull and the boar in the woods of Hampstead. Even under the later Plantagenets, the royal forests were sixty-eight in number. In the forest of Arden, it was said that down to modern times, a squirrel might leap from tree to tree for nearly the whole length of Warwickshire. The excavation of ancient pile villages in the valley of the Po has shown that long before the rise and probably the foundation of Rome, the north of Italy was covered with dense woods of elms, chestnuts, and especially of oaks. Archaeology is here confirmed by history, for classical writers contain many references to Italian forests, which have now disappeared. As late as the 4th century before our era, Rome was divided from central Etruria by the dreaded Ciminian forest, which Livy compares to the woods of Germany. No merchant, if we may trust the Roman historian, had ever penetrated its pathless solitudes, and it was deemed a most daring feat when a Roman general, after sending two scouts to explore its intricacies, led his army into the forest, and, making his way to a ridge of the wooded mountains, looked down on the rich Etrurian fields spread out below. In Greece, beautiful woods of pine, oak, and other trees still linger on the slopes of the high Arcadian mountains, still adorn with their verdure and deep gorge through which the laden hurries to join the sacred Alpheus. And were still, down to a few years ago, mirrored in the dark blue waters of the lonely place of Phineas. But they are mere fragments of the forests, which clothe great tracts in antiquity, and which at a more remote epoch may have spanned the Greek peninsula from sea to sea. From an examination of the Teutonic words for temple, Grimm has made it probable that amongst the Germans the oldest sanctuaries were natural woods. However that may be, tree worship is well attested for all the great European families of the Aryan stock. Amongst the Celts, the oak worship of the Druids is familiar to everyone, and their old word for sanctuary seems to be identical in origin and meaning with the Latin nemus, a grove or woodland glade, which still survives in the name of Nemi. Sacred groves were common among the ancient Germans, and tree worship is hardly extinct amongst their descendants at the present day. How serious that worship was in former times may be gathered from the ferocious penalty appointed by the old German laws for such as dared to peel the bark of a standing tree. The culprit's navel was to be cut out and nailed to the part of the tree which he had peeled, and he was to be driven round and round the tree till all his guts were wound about its trunk. 
The intention of the punishment clearly was to replace the dead bark by a living substitute taken from the culprit. It was a life for a life, the life of a man for the life of a tree. At Uppsala, the old religious capital of Sweden, there was a sacred grove in which every tree was regarded as divine. The heathen Slavs worshipped trees and groves. The Lithuanians were not converted to Christianity till towards the close of the 14th century, and amongst them, at the date of their conversion, the worship of trees was prominent. Some of them revered remarkable oaks and other great shady trees from which they received oracular responses. Some maintained holy groves about their villages or houses, where even to break a twig would have been a sin. They thought that he who cut a bough in such a grove either died suddenly or was crippled in one of his limbs. Proofs of the prevalence of tree worship in ancient Greece and Italy are abundant. In the sanctuary of Asclepius at Cos, for example, it was forbidden to cut down the cypress trees under a penalty of a thousand drachmas. But nowhere, perhaps, in the ancient world was this antique form of religion better preserved than in the heart of the great metropolis itself. In the Forum, the busy center of Roman life, the sacred fig tree of Romulus was worshipped down to the days of the empire, and the withering of its trunk was enough to spread consternation through the city. Again, on the slope of the Palatine Hill, grew a cornel tree, which was esteemed one of the most sacred objects in Rome. Whenever the tree appeared to a passer-by to be drooping, he set up a hue and cry, which was echoed by the people in the street, and soon a crowd might be seen running helter-skelter from all sides with buckets of water, as if, says Plutarch, they were hastening to put out a fire. Among the tribes of the Finnish, Ugrian stock, and Europe, the heathen worship was performed for the most part in sacred groves, which were always enclosed with a fence. Such a grove often consisted merely of a glade or clearing with a few trees dotted about, upon which, in former times, the skins of the sacrificial victims were hung. The central point of the grove, at least among the tribes of the Volga, was the sacred tree, beside which everything else sank into insignificance. Before it, the worshippers assembled, and the priest offered its prayers— at its roots the victim was sacrificed, and its boughs sometimes served as a pulpit. No wood might be hewn and no branch broken in the grove, and women were generally forbidden to enter it. But it is necessary to examine in some detail the notions on which the worship of trees and plants is based. To the savage, the world in general is animate, and trees and plants are no exception to the rule. He thinks that they have souls like his own, and he treats them accordingly. They say, writes the ancient vegetarian Porphyry, that primitive men led an unhappy life, for their superstition did not stop at animals, but extended even to plants. For why should the slaughter of an ox or a sheep be a greater wrong than the felling of a fir or an oak, seeing that a soul is implanted in these trees also? Similarly, the Hidatsa, Indians of North America believe that every natural object has its spirit, or to speak more properly, its shade. To these shades, some consideration or respect is due, but not equally to all. For example, the shade of the cottonwood, the greatest tree in the valley of the upper Missouri, is supposed to possess an intelligence which, if properly approached, may help the Indians in certain undertakings. But the shades of the shrubs and grasses are of little account. When the Missouri, swollen by a freshet in the spring, carries away part of its banks and sweeps some tall tree into its current, it is said that the spirit of the tree cries while the roots still cling to the land and until the trunk falls with a splash into the stream. Formerly, the Indians considered it wrong to fell one of these giants, and when large logs were needed, they made use only of trees which had fallen of themselves. Till lately, some of the more credulous old men declared that many of the misfortunes of their people were caused by this modern disregard for the rights of the living cottonwood. The Iroquois believed that each species of tree, shrub, plant, and herb, had its own spirit, and to these spirits it was their custom to return thanks. The Wanika of eastern Africa fancy that every tree, and especially every coconut tree, has its spirit. The destruction of a coconut tree is regarded as equivalent to matricide, because the tree gives them life and nourishment as a mother does her child. 
Siamese monks believing that there are souls everywhere and that to destroy anything whatever is forcibly to dispossess a soul will not break a branch of a tree as they will not break the arm of an innocent person. These monks, of course, are Buddhists, but Buddhist animism is not a philosophical theory. It is simply a common savage dogma incorporated in the system of an historical religion. To suppose, with Benfi and others, that the theories of animism and transmigration, current among rude peoples of Asia, are derived from Buddhism, is to reverse the facts. Sometimes it is only particular sorts of trees that are supposed to be tenanted by spirits. Acrobal, in Dalmatia, it is said that among great beeches, oaks, and other trees, there are some that are endowed with shades or souls, and whoever fells one of them must die on the spot, or at least live an invalid for the rest of his days. If a woodman fears that a tree which he has felled is one of this sort, he must cut off the head of a live hen on the stump of the tree, with his very same axe, with which he cut down the tree." This will protect him from all harm, even if the tree be one of the animated kind. The silk cotton trees, which rear their enormous trunks to a stupendous height, far out topping all the other trees of the forest, are regarded with reverence throughout West Africa, from the Senegal to the Niger, and are believed to be the abode of a god or spirit. Among the U-speaking people of the slave coast, the indwelling god of this giant of the forest goes by the name of Hunton trees in which he specially dwells for it is not every silk cotton tree that he thus honors are surrounded by a girdle of palm leaves and sacrifices of fowls and occasionally of human beings are fastened to the trunk or laid against the foot of the tree a tree distinguished by a girdle of palm leaves may not be cut down or injured in any way and even silk cotton trees which are not supposed to be animated by hunting may not be felled unless the woodman first offers a sacrifice of fowls and palm oil to purge himself of the proposed sacrilege to omit the sacrifice is an offense which may be punished with death. Among the Kangra Mountains of the Punjab, a girl used to be annually sacrificed to an old cedar tree, the families of the village taking it in turn to supply the victim. The tree was cut down not very many years ago. If trees are animate, they are necessarily sensitive, and the cutting of them down becomes a delicate surgical operation, which must be performed with as tender a regard as possible for the feelings of the sufferers, who otherwise may turn and rend the careless or bungling operator. When an oak is being felled, it gives a kind of shrieks or groans that may be heard a mile off, as if it were the genius of the oak lamenting. E. Wild Esquire hath heard it several times." The Ojibwe's very seldom cut down green or living trees from the idea that it puts them in pain, and some of their medicine men profess to have heard the wailing of the trees under the axe. Trees that bleed and utter cries of pain or indignation when they are hacked or burned occur very often in Chinese books, even in standard histories. Old peasants in some parts of Austria still believe that forest trees are animate and will not allow an incision to be made in the bark without special cause. They have heard from their fathers that the tree feels the cut, not less than a wounded man is hurt. In felling a tree, they beg its pardon. It is said that in the upper palatinate, also old woodmen still secretly ask a fine sound tree to forgive them before they cut it down. So in Jarkino, the woodman craves pardon of the trees he fells. Before the Ilocanes of Luzon cut down trees in the virgin forest or on the mountains, they recite some verses to the following effect. Be not uneasy, my friend, though we fell what we have been ordered to fell. This they do in order not to draw down on themselves the hatred of the spirits who live in the trees and who are apt to avenge themselves by visiting with grievous sickness such as injure them wantonly. The Basoga of Central Africa think that, when a tree is cut down, the angry spirit which inhabits it may cause the death of the chief and his family. To prevent this disaster, they consult a medicine man before they fell a tree. If the man of skill gives leave to proceed, the woodman first offers a fowl and a goat to the tree. Then, as soon as he has given the first blow with the axe, he applies his mouth to the cut and sucks some of the sap. In this way, he forms a brotherhood with the tree, just as two men become blood brothers by sucking each other's blood. After that, he can cut down his tree brother with impunity. But the spirits of vegetation are not always treated with deference and respect. 
if fair words and kind treatment do not move them, stronger measures are sometimes resorted to. The durian tree of the East Indies, whose smooth stem often shoots up to a height of 80 or 90 feet without sending out a branch, bears a fruit of the most delicious flavor and the most disgusting stench. The Malays cultivate the tree for the sake of its fruit, and have been known to resort to a peculiar ceremony for the purpose of stimulating its fertility. Near Zugra in Selangor, there is a small grove of durian trees, and on a specially chosen day, the villagers used to assemble in it. Thereupon, one of the local sorcerers would take a hatchet and deliver several shrewd blows on the trunk of the most barren of the trees, saying, "'Will you now bear fruit or not?' If you do not, I shall fell you. To this the tree replied through the mouth of another man, who had climbed a mangostan tree, hard by, the durian tree being unclimbable. Yes, I will now bear fruit. I beg of you not to fell me. So in Japan, to make trees bear fruit, two men go into an orchard. One of them climbs up a tree, and the other stands at the foot with an axe. The man with the axe asks the tree whether it will yield a good crop next year and threatens to cut it down if it does not. To this, the man among the branches replies on behalf of the tree that it will bear abundantly. Odd as this mode of horticulture may seem to us, it has its exact parallels in Europe. On Christmas Eve, many a South Slovenian and Bulgarian peasant swings an axe threateningly against a barren fruit tree, while another man standing by intercedes for the menaced tree, saying, Do not cut it down, it will soon bear fruit. Thrice the axe is swung, and thrice the impending blow is arrested at the entreaty of the intercessor. After that, the frightened tree will certainly bear fruit next year. The conception of trees and plants as animated beings naturally results in treating them as male and female, who can be married to each other in a real and not merely a figurative or a poetical sense of the word. The notion is not purely fanciful, for plants, like animals, have their sexes and reproduce their kind by the union of the male and female elements. But whereas in all the higher animals the organs of the two sexes are regularly separated between different individuals, in most plants they exist together in every individual of the species. This rule, however, is by no means universal, and in many species the male plant is distinct from the female. The distinction appears to have been observed by some savages, for we are told that the Maoris are acquainted with the sex of trees, etc., and have distinct names for the male and female of some trees. The ancients knew the difference between the male and female date palm, and fertilized them artificially by shaking the pollen of the male tree over the flowers of the female. The fertilization took place in spring. Among the heathen of Haran, the month during which the palms were fertilized bore the name of the date month, and at this time they celebrated the marriage festival of all the gods and goddesses. Different from this true and fruitful marriage of the palm are the false and barren marriages of plants which play a part in Hindu superstition. For example, if a Hindu has planted a grove of mangoes, neither he nor his wife may taste of the fruit until he has formally married one of the trees as a bridegroom to a tree of a different sort, commonly a tamarind tree, which grows near it in the grove. If there is no tamarind to act as bride, a jasmine will serve the turn. The expenses of such a marriage are often considerable, for the more Brahmins are feasted at it, the greater the glory of the owner of the grove. A family has been known to sell its golden and silver trinkets, and to borrow all the money they could in order to marry a mango tree to a jasmine with due pomp and ceremony. On Christmas Eve, German peasants used to tie fruit trees together with straw ropes to make them bear fruit, saying that the trees were thus married. In the Moluccas, when the clove trees are in blossom, they are treated like a pregnant woman. No noise may be made near them. No light or fire may be carried past them at night. No one may approach them with his hat on. All must uncover in their presence. These precautions are observed lest the tree should be alarmed and bear no fruit, or should drop its fruit too soon, like the untimely delivery of a woman who has been frightened in her pregnancy. So, in the East, the growing rice crop is often treated with the same considerate regard as a breeding woman. Thus, in Amboina, when the rice is in bloom, the people say that it is pregnant, and fire no guns, and make no other noises near the field, for fear lest, if the rice were thus disturbed, it would miscarry, and the crop would be all straw and no grain. Sometimes it is the souls of the dead which are believed to animate trees. 
the Dieri tribe of Central Australia, regard as very sacred certain trees, which are supposed to be their fathers transformed. Hence they speak with reverence of these trees, and are careful that they shall not be cut down or burned. If the settlers require them to hew down the trees, they earnestly protest against it, asserting that were they to do so, they would have no luck, and might be punished for not protecting their ancestors. Some of the Philippine islanders believe that the souls of their ancestors are in certain trees, which they therefore spare. If they are obliged to fell one of these trees, they excuse themselves to it by saying that it was the priest who made them do it. The spirits take up their abode by preference in tall and stately trees with great spreading branches. When the wind rustles the leaves, the natives fancy it is the voice of the spirit, and they never pass near one of these trees without bowing respectfully and asking pardon of the spirit for disturbing his repose. Among the ignorotes, every village has its sacred tree in which the souls of the dead forefathers of the hamlet reside. Offerings are made to the tree, and any injury done to it is believed to entail some misfortune on the village. Were the tree cut down, the village and all its inhabitants would inevitably perish. In Korea, the souls of people who die of the plague or by the roadside, and of women who expire in childbirth, invariably take up their abode in trees. To such spirits, offerings of cake, wine, and pork are made on heaps of stones, piled under the trees. In China, it has been customary from time immemorial to plant trees on graves in order thereby to strengthen the soul of the deceased, and thus to save his body from corruption." And as the evergreen, cypress, and pine are deemed to be fuller of vitality than other trees, they have been chosen by preference for this purpose. Hence, the trees that grow on graves are sometimes identified with the souls of the departed. Among the Myokya, an aboriginal race of southern and western China, a sacred tree stands at the entrance of every village, and the inhabitants believe that it is tenanted by the soul of their first ancestor, and that it rules their destiny. Sometimes there is a sacred grove near a village where the trees are suffered to rot and die on the spot. Their fallen branches cumber the ground, and no one may remove them unless he has first asked leave of the spirit of the tree and offered him a sacrifice. Among the Moravis of southern Africa, the burial ground is always regarded as a holy place where neither a tree may be felled nor a beast killed, because everything there is supposed to be tenanted by the souls of the dead. In most, if not all of these cases, the spirit is viewed as incorporate in the tree. It animates the tree and must suffer and die with it. But according to another, and probably later opinion, the tree is not the body, but merely the abode of the tree spirit, which can quit it and return to it at pleasure. The inhabitants of Siao, an East Indian island, believe in certain sylvan spirits who dwell in forests or in great solitary trees. At full moon, the spirit comes forth from his lurking place and roams about. He has a big head, very long arms and legs, and a ponderous body. In order to propitiate the wood spirits, people bring offerings of food, fowls, goats, and so forth to the places which they are supposed to haunt. The people of Nias think that, when a tree dies, its liberated spirit becomes a demon, which can kill a coconut palm by merely lighting on its branches, and can cause the death of all the children in the house by perching on one of the posts that support it. Further, they are of opinion that certain trees are at all times inhabited by roving demons who, if the trees were damaged, would be set free to go about on errands of mischief. Hence, the people respect these trees and are careful not to cut them down. Not a few ceremonies observed at cutting down haunted trees are based on the belief that the spirits have it in their power to quit the trees at pleasure or in case of need. Thus, when the Pelu Islanders are felling a tree, they conjure the spirit of their tree to leave it and settle on another. The wily African of the slave coast, who wishes to fell an Asheran tree, but knows that he cannot do it so long as the spirit remains in the tree, places a little palm oil on the ground as a bait, and then, when the unsuspecting spirit has quitted the tree to partake of this dainty, hastens to cut down its late abode. When the Tobuncos of Celebus are about to clear a piece of forest in order to plant rice, they build a tiny house and furnish it with tiny clothes and some food and gold. Then they call together all the spirits of the wood, offer them the little house with its contents, and beseech them to quit the spot. After that, they may safely cut down the wood without fearing to wound themselves in so doing. Before the Tomori, 
another tribe of celibus, fell a tall tree, they lay a quid of betel at its foot, and invite the spirit who dwells in the tree to change its lodging. Moreover, they set a little ladder against the trunk to enable him to descend with safety and comfort. The mandalings of Sumatra endeavor to lay the blame of all such misdeeds at the door of the Dutch authorities. Thus, when a man is cutting a road through a forest and has to fell a tree which blocks the way, he will not begin to ply his axe until he has said, Spirit who lodgest in this tree, take it not ill that I cut down thy dwelling, for it is done at no wish of mine, but by order of the controller. And when he wishes to clear a piece of forest land for cultivation, it is necessary that he should come to a satisfactory understanding with the woodland spirits who live there before he lays low their leafy dwellings. For this purpose, he goes to the middle of the plot of ground, stoops down, and pretends to pick up a letter. Then, unfolding a bit of paper, he reads aloud an imaginary letter from the Dutch government, in which he is strictly enjoined to set about clearing the land without delay. Having done so, he says, You hear that, spirits? I must begin clearing at once, or I shall be hanged. Even when a tree has been felled, sawn into planks, and used to build a house, it is possible that the woodland spirits may still be lurking in the timber, and accordingly some people seek to propitiate him before or after they occupy the new house. Hence, when a new dwelling is ready, the Tarajas of Celebus kill a goat, a pig, or a buffalo, and smear all the woodwork with its blood." If the building is a lobo or spirit house, a fowl or a dog is killed on the ridge of the roof, and its blood allowed to flow down on both sides. The ruder Tanapu, in such a case, sacrifice a human being on the roof. The sacrifice on the roof of a lobo or temple serves the same purpose as the smearing of blood on the woodwork of an ordinary house. The intention is to propitiate the forest spirits who may still be in the timber. They are thus put in good humor, and will do the inmates of the house no harm. For a like reason, people in Celebus and the Moluccas are much afraid of planting a post upside down at the building of a house. For the forest spirit, who might still be in the timber, would very naturally resent the indignity and visit the inmates with sickness. The Cayennes of Borneo are of opinion that tree spirits stand very stiffly on the point of honor and visit men with their displeasure for any injury done to them. Hence, after building a house, whereby they have been forced to ill-treat many trees, these people observe a period of penance for a year during which they must abstain from many things, such as the killing of bears, tiger-cats, and serpents. Subsection 2. Beneficent Powers of Tree Spirits when a tree comes to be viewed no longer as the body of the tree spirit, but simply as its abode, which it can quit at pleasure, an important advance has been made in religious thought. Animism is passing into polytheism. In other words, instead of regarding each tree as a living and conscious being, man now sees in it merely a lifeless, inert mass, tenanted for a longer or shorter time by a supernatural being who, as he can pass freely from tree to tree, thereby enjoys a certain right of possession or lordship over the trees, and, ceasing to be a tree soul, becomes a forest god. As soon as the tree spirit is thus in a measure disengaged from each particular tree, he begins to change his shape and assume the body of a man, in virtue of general tendency of early thought to clothe all abstract spiritual beings in concrete human form. Hence, in classical art, the sylvan deities are depicted in human shape, their woodland character being denoted by a branch or some equally obvious symbol. But this change of shape does not affect the essential character of the tree spirit. The powers which he exercised as a tree soul incorporate in a tree. He still continues to wield as a god of trees. This I shall now attempt to prove in detail. I shall show, first, that trees considered as animate beings are credited with the power of making the rain to fall, the sun to shine, flocks and herds to multiply, and women to bring forth easily, and, second, that the very same powers are attributed to tree gods, conceived as anthropomorphic beings, or as actually incarnate in living men. First, then, trees or tree spirits are believed to give rain and sunshine. When the missionary Jerome of Prague was persuading the heathen Lithuanians to fell their sacred groves, a multitude of women besought the prince of Lithuania to stop him, saying that with the woods he was destroying the house of God, from which they had been wont to get rain and sunshine. 
The Mundaris in Assam think that if a tree in the sacred grove is felled, the sylvan gods evince their displeasure by withholding rain. In order to procure rain, the inhabitants of Monyo, a village in Segang district of Upper Burma, chose the largest tamarind tree near the village and named it the haunt of the spirit, Nat, who controls the rain. Then they offered bread, coconuts, plantains and fowls to the guardian spirit of the village and to the spirit who gives rain and they prayed o lord not have pity on us poor mortals and stay not the rain inasmuch as our offering is given ungrudgingly let the rain fall day and night afterwards libations were made in honor of the spirit of the tamarind tree and still later three elderly women dressed in fine clothes and wearing necklaces and earrings sang the rain song again tree spirits make the crops to grow amongst the mandaris every village has its sacred grove and the grove deities are held responsible for the crops and are especially honored at all the great agricultural festivals the people of the Gold Coast are in the habit of sacrificing at the foot of certain tall trees, and they think that if one of these were felled, all the fruits of the earth would perish. The Gallas dance in couples round sacred trees, praying for a good harvest. Every couple consists of a man and a woman who are linked together by a stick, of which each holds one end. Under their arms, they carry green corn or grass. Swedish peasants stick a leafy branch in each furrow of their cornfields, believing that this will ensure an abundant crop. The same idea comes out in the German and French custom of the harvest may. This is a large branch or a whole tree which is decked with ears of corn, brought home on the last wagon from the harvest field, and fastened on the roof of the farmhouse or the barn where it remains for a year. Manhart has proved that this branch or tree embodies the tree spirit, conceived as the spirit of vegetation in general, whose vivifying and fructifying influence is thus brought to bear upon the corn in particular. Hence in Swabia, the harvest may is fastened amongst the last stalks of corn left standing on the field. In other places, it is planted on the cornfield, and the last sheaf cut is attached to its trunk." again the tree spirit makes the herds to multiply and blesses women with offspring in northern india the umbilica officinalis is a sacred tree on the eleventh of the month falgen february libations are poured at the foot of the tree a red or yellow string is bound about the trunk and prayers are offered to it for the fruitfulness of women animals and crops again in northern india the coconut is esteemed one of the most sacred fruits and is called trifala or the fruit of Sri, the goddess of prosperity. It is the symbol of fertility, and all through Upper India is kept in shrines and presented by the priests to women who desire to become mothers. In the town of Kwa, near Old Calabar, there used to grow a palm tree which ensured conception to any barren woman who ate a nut from its branches. In Europe, the may tree or maypole is apparently supposed to possess similar powers over both women and cattle. Thus, in some parts of Germany, on the 1st of May, the peasants set up may trees or may bushes at the doors or stables and byres, one for each horse and cow. This is thought to make the cows yield much milk of the irish we are told that they fancy a green bough of a tree fastened on may day against the house will produce plenty of milk that summer on the second of july some of the wens used to set up an oak tree in the middle of the village with an iron cock fastened to its top then they danced around it and drove the cattle round it to make them thrive the circassians regard the pear tree as the protector of cattle so they cut down a young pear tree in the forest branch it and carry it home where it is adored as a divinity almost every house has one such pear tree in autumn on the day of the festival the tree is carried into the house with great ceremony to the sound of music and amid the joyous cries of all the inmates who compliment it on its fortunate arrival it is covered with candles and a cheese is fastened to its top round about it they eat drink and sing then they bid the tree good-bye and take it back to the courtyard where it remains for the rest of the year set up against the wall without receiving any mark of respect in the tuho tribe of maoris the power of making women fruitful is ascribed to trees these trees are associated with the navel string of definite mythical ancestors as indeed the navel strings of all children used to be hung upon them down to quite recent times a barren woman had to embrace such a tree with her arms and she received a male or female child according as she embraced the east or west side 
The common European custom of placing a green bush on May Day before or on the house of a beloved maiden probably originated in the belief of the fertilizing power of the tree spirit. In some parts of Bavaria, such bushes are set up also at the houses of newly married pairs, and the practice is only omitted if the wife is near her confinement. For in that case, they say that the husband has set up a maybush for himself. Among the South Slovenians, a barren woman who desires to have a child places a new camis upon a fruitful tree on the eve of St. George's Day. Next morning before sunrise, she examines the garment, and if she finds that some living creature has crept in it, she hopes that her wish will be fulfilled within the year. Then she puts on the chemise, confident that she will be as fruitful as the tree on which the garment has passed the night. Among the Karakirgis, barren women roll themselves on the ground under a solitary apple tree in order to obtain offspring. Lastly, the power of granting to women an easy delivery at childbirth is ascribed to trees both in Sweden and Africa. In some districts of Sweden, there was formerly a bardtrod, a guardian tree, lime, ash, or elm, in the neighborhood of every farm. No one would pluck a single leaf of the sacred tree, any injury to which was pulled by ill luck or sickness. Pregnant women used to clasp the tree in their arms in order to ensure an easy delivery. In some tribes of the Congo region, pregnant women make themselves garments out of the bark of a certain sacred tree because they believe that this tree delivers them from the dangers that attend childbearing. The story that Leto clasped a palm tree and an olive tree or two laurel trees when she was about to give birth to the divine twins apollo and artemis perhaps points to a similar greek belief in the efficacy of certain trees to facilitate delivery chapter 10 relics of tree worship in modern europe from the foregoing review of the beneficent qualities commonly ascribed to tree spirits it is easy to understand why customs like the may tree or may pole have prevailed so widely and figured so prominently in the popular festivals of European peasants. In spring or early summer, or even on Midsummer Day, it was and still is in many parts of Europe the custom to go out to the woods, cut down a tree, and bring it into the village, where it is set up amid general rejoicings, or the people cut branches in the woods and fasten them on every house. The intention of these customs is to bring home to the village and to each house the blessings which the tree spirit has in its power to bestow. Hence the custom in some places of planting a may tree before every house, or of carrying the village may tree from door to door, that every household may receive its share of the blessing. Out of the mass of evidence on the subject, a few examples may be selected. Sir Henry Piers, in the description of Westmeath, writing in 1682, says... On May Eve, every family sets up before their door a green bush, strewed over with yellow flowers, which the meadows yield plentifully. In countries where timber is plentiful, they erect tall slender trees, which stand high, and they continue almost the whole year. So as a stranger would go nigh to imagine that they were all signs of ale cellars, and that all houses were ale houses. In Northamptonshire, a young tree ten or twelve feet high used to be planted before each house on May Day, so as to appear growing. Flowers were thrown over it and strewn about the door. Among ancient customs still retained by the Cornish may be reckoned that of decking their doors and porches on the first of May with green boughs of sycamore and hawthorn, and of planting trees, or rather stumps of trees, before their houses. In the north of England, it was formerly the custom for young people to rise a little after midnight on the morning of the first of May, and go out with music and the blowing of horns into the woods, where they broke branches and adorned them with nosegays and crowns of flowers. This done, they returned about sunrise, and fastened the flower-decked branches over the doors and windows of their houses. At Abingdon in Berkshire, young people formerly went about in groups on May morning, singing a carol, of which the following are two of the verses. We've been rambling all the night, and some time of this day, and now returning back again, we bring a garland gay. A garland gay we bring you here, and at your door we stand. It is a sprout well budded out, the work of our Lord's hand. At the towns of Saffron, Weldon, and Debden in Essex, on the first of May, little girls go about in parties from door to door singing a song, almost identical with the above, and carrying garlands. A doll dressed in white is usually placed in the middle of each garland. Similar customs have been, and indeed are still observed, in various parts of England. 
the garlands are generally in the forms of hoops intersecting each other at right angles. It appears that a hoop wreathed with a rowan and marsh marigold and bearing suspended within it two balls is still carried on May Day by villagers in some parts of Ireland. The balls, which are sometimes covered with gold and silver paper, are said to have originally represented the sun and moon. In some villages of the Vosges Mountains, on the first Sunday of May, young girls go in bands from house to house, singing a song in praise of May, in which mention is made of the bread and meal that come in May. If money is given them, they fasten a green bough to the door. If it is refused, they wish the family, many children, and no bread to feed them. In the French department of Mayenne, boys who bore the name of Mayotines used to go about from farm to farm on the 1st of May singing carols, for which they received money or drink. They planted a small tree or a branch of a tree. Near Saverne in Alsatia, bands of people go about carrying May trees. Amongst them is a man dressed in a white shirt, with his face blackened. In front of him is carried a large may tree, but each member of the band also carries a smaller one. One of the company bears a huge basket in which he collects eggs, bacon, and so forth. On the Thursday before Whitsunday, the Russian villagers go out into the woods, sing songs, weave garlands, and cut down a young birch tree, which they dress up in women's clothes, or adorn with many colored shreds and ribbons. After that comes a feast, at the end of which they take the dressed-up birch tree, carry it home to their village with joyful dance and song, and set it up in one of the houses, where it remains as an honored guest till Whitsunday. On the two intervening days, they pay visits to the house where their guest is, but on the third day, Whitsunday, they take her to a stream and fling her into its waters, throwing their garlands after her. In the Russian custom, the dressing of the birch in women's clothes shows how clearly the tree is personified, and the throwing it into a stream is most probably a rain charm. In some parts of Sweden, on the eve of May Day, lads go about carrying each a bunch of fresh birch twigs, wholly or partly in leaf. With the village fiddler at their head, they make the round of the houses singing May songs. The burden of their songs is a prayer for fine weather, a plentiful harvest, and worldly and spiritual blessings. One of them carries a basket in which he collects gifts of eggs and the like. If they were well received, they stick a leafy twig in the roof over the cottage door. But in Sweden, midsummer is the season when the ceremonies are chiefly observed. On the eve of St. John, the 23rd of June, the horses are thoroughly cleansed and garnished with green boughs and flowers. Young fir trees are raised at the doorway and elsewhere about the homestead, and very often small umbrageous arbors are constructed in the garden. In Stockholm, on this day, a leaf market is held at which thousands of maypoles, mastranger, from six inches to twelve feet high, decorated with leaves, flowers, slips of colored paper, gilt eggshells strung on reeds, and so on, are exposed for sale. Bonfires are lit on the hills, and the people dance around them and jump over them. But the chief event of the day is setting up the maypole. This consists of a straight and tall spruce pine tree stripped of its branches. At times, hoops, and at others, pieces of wood placed crosswise are attached to it at intervals, whilst at others it is provided with bows, representing, so to say, a man with his arms akimbo. From top to bottom, not only the mashtang, maypole, itself, but the hoops, bows, etc., are ornamented with leaves, flowers, slips of various cloth, gilt, eggshells, etc., and on top of it, is a large vein, or it may be a flag. The raising of the maypole, the decoration of which is done by the village maidens, is an affair of much ceremony. The people flock to it from all quarters and dance around it in a great ring. Midsummer customs of the same sort used to be observed in some parts of Germany. Thus, in the towns of the upper Haars Mountains, tall fir trees with the bark peeled off their lower trunks were set up in open places and decked with flowers and eggs, which were painted yellow and red. Round these trees, the young folk danced by day and the old folk in the evening. In some parts of Bohemia, also a maypole or midsummer tree is erected on St. John's Eve. The lads fetch a tall fir or pine from the wood and set it up on a height where the girls deck it with nosegays, garlands, and red ribbons. It is afterwards burned. It would be needless to illustrate at length the custom which has prevailed in various parts of Europe, such as England, France, and Germany, of setting up a village may tree or maypole on May Day. A few examples will suffice. 
the puritanical writer Philip Stubbs, in his Anatomy of Abuses, first published in London in 1583, has described with manifest disgust how they used to bring in the Maypole in the days of good Queen Bess. His description affords us a vivid glimpse of Merry England in the olden time. Against May, Whitsunday, or other time, all the young men and maids, old men and wives, run gadding over night to the woods, groves, hills, and mountains, where they spend all the night in pleasant pastimes, and in the morning they return, bringing with them birch and branches of trees, to deck their assemblies withal, and no marvel, for there is a great lord present among them, as superintendent and lord over their pastimes and sports, namely Satan, prince of hell. But the chiefest jewel they bring from thence is their maypole, which they bring home with great veneration, as thus. They have twenty or forty yoke of oxen, every ox having a great nosegay of flowers placed on the tip of his horns, and these oxen draw home this maypole, this stinking idol, rather, which is covered all over with flowers and herbs, bound round about with strings from the top to the bottom, and sometimes painted with variable colors, with two or three hundred men, women, and children following it with great devotion and thus being reared up with handkerchiefs and flags hovering on the top they straw the ground round about bind green boughs about it set up summer halls bowers and arbors hard by it and then fall they to dance about it like as the heathen people did at the dedication of the idols whereof this is a perfect pattern or rather the thing itself I have heard it credibly reported, and that viva voce, by men of great gravity and reputation, that of forty, three score, or a hundred maids going to the wood overnight, there have scarcely the third part of them returned home again undefiled. In Swabia, on the first of May, a tall fir tree used to be fetched into the village, where it was decked with ribbons and set up. Then the people danced around it merrily to music. The tree stood on the village green the whole year through, until a fresh tree was brought in next May Day. In Saxony, people were not content with bringing the summer symbolically, as king or queen, into the village. They brought the fresh green itself from the woods, even into the houses, that is the May or Whitsuntide trees, which are mentioned in documents from the 13th century onwards. The fetching in of the May tree was also a festival, the people went out into the woods to seek the May, Majam Querer, brought young trees, especially firs and birches, into the village and set them up before the doors of the houses or of the cattle stalls or in the rooms. Young fellows erected such May trees, as we have already said, before the chambers of their sweethearts. Beside these household maize, a great May tree or maypole, which had also been brought in solemn procession to the village, was set up in the middle of the village, or in the marketplace of the town. It had been chosen by the whole community, who watched over it most carefully. Generally, the tree was stripped of its branches and leaves, nothing but the crown being left, on which were displayed, in addition to many colored ribbons and cloths, a variety of victuals, such as sausages, cakes, and eggs. The young folk exerted themselves to obtain these prizes. In the greasy poles, which are still to be seen at our fairs, we have a relic of these old maypoles. Not uncommonly, there was a race on foot or on horseback to the may tree a Whitsunday pastime, which in course of time has been divested of its goal and survives as a popular custom to this day in many parts of Germany. At Bordeaux, on the 1st of May, the boys of each street used to erect in it a maypole, which they adorned with garlands and great crowns, and every evening during the whole of the month, the young people of both sexes dance singing about the pole. Down to the present day, May trees decked with flowers and ribbons are set up on May Day in every village and hamlet of Gay Province. Under them, the young folk make merry and the old folk rest. In all these cases, apparently, the custom is or was to bring in a new May tree each year. However, in England, the village maypole seems as a rule, at least in later times, to have been permanent, not renewed annually. Villages of Upper Bavaria renew their maypole once every three, four, or five years. It is a fir tree fetched from the forest, and amid all the wreaths, flags, and inscriptions with which it is bedecked, an essential part is the bunch of dark green foliage left at the top, as a memento that in it we have to do, not with a dead pole, but with a living tree from the greenwood. We can hardly doubt that originally the practice everywhere was to set up a new may tree every year, as the object of the custom was to bring in the fructifying spirit of vegetation, newly awakened in spring, 
The end would have been defeated if, instead of a living tree, green and sappy, an old withered one had been erected year after year or allowed to stand permanently. When, however, the meaning of the custom had been forgotten, and the may-tree was regarded simply as a centre for holiday merrymaking, people saw no reason for felling a fresh tree every year, and preferred to let the same tree stand permanently, only decking it with fresh flowers on May Day. But even when the maypole had thus become a fixture, the need of giving it the appearance of being a green tree, not a dead pole, was sometimes felt. Thus, at Weaverham, in Cheshire, are two maypoles, which are decorated on this day, May Day, with all due attention to the ancient solemnity. The sides are hung with garlands, and the top terminated by a birch or other tall slender tree, with its leaves on, the bark being peeled, and the stem spliced to the pole, so as to give the appearance of one tree from the summit. Thus the renewal of the May tree is like the renewal of the harvest May, each is intended to secure a fresh portion of the fertilizing spirit of vegetation and to preserve it throughout the year. But whereas the efficacy of the harvest may is restricted to promoting the growth of the crops, that of the may tree or may branch extends also, as we have seen, to women and cattle. Lastly, it is worth noting that the old may tree is sometimes burned at the end of the year. Thus, in the district of Prague, young people break pieces of the public may tree and place them behind the holy pictures in their rooms, where they remain till next May Day, and are then burned on the hearth. In Württemberg, the bushes which are set up on the houses on Palm Sunday are sometimes left there for a year and then burnt. So much for the tree spirit conceived as incorporate or imminent in the tree. We have now to show that the tree spirit is often conceived and represented as detached from the tree and clothed in human form, and even as embodied in living men or women. The evidence for this anthropomorphic representation of the tree spirit is largely to be found in the popular customs of European peasantry. There is an instructive class of cases in which the tree spirit is represented simultaneously in vegetable form and in human form, which are set side by side as for the express purpose of explaining each other. In these cases, the human representative of the tree spirit is sometimes a doll or puppet, sometimes a living person, but whether a puppet or a person, it is placed beside a tree or bough, so that together the person or puppet and the tree or bough form a sort of bilingual inscription, the one being, so to speak, a translation of the other. Here, therefore, there is no room left for doubt that the spirit of the tree is actually represented in human form. Thus, in Bohemia, on the fourth Sunday in Lent, young people throw a puppet called Death into the water. Then the girls go into the wood, cut down a young tree, and fasten to it a puppet dressed in white clothes, to look like a woman. With this tree and puppet, they go from house to house, collecting gratitudes and singing songs with the refrain, We carry death out of the village. We bring summer into the village. Here, as we shall see later on, the summer is the spirit of vegetation returning or reviving in spring. In some parts of our own country, children go about asking for pence with some small imitations of maypoles and with a finely dressed doll, which they call the Lady of the May. In these cases, the tree and the puppet are obviously regarded as equivalent. At Thon in Alsatia, a girl called the Little May Rose, dressed in white, carries a small may tree, which is gay with garlands and ribbons. Her companions collect gifts from door to door, singing a song. Little May Rose, turn round three times, let us look at you round and round. Rose of the May, come to the greenwood away, we will be merry all. So we go from the May to the roses." In the course of the song, a wish is expressed that those who give nothing may lose their fowls by the marten, that their vine may bear no clusters, their tree no nuts, their field no corn. The produce of the year is supposed to depend on the gifts offered to these May singers. Here, and in the cases mentioned above, where children go about with green boughs or garlands on May Day, singing and collecting money, the meaning is that, with the spirit of vegetation, they bring plenty and good luck to the house, and they expect to be paid for the service. In Russian Lithuania, on the 1st of May, they used to set up a green tree before the village. Then the rustic swains chose the prettiest girl, crowned her, swathed her in birch branches, and set her beside the May tree, where they danced, sang, and shouted, O oh May, O oh May, in Brie, Isle de France, a May tree is erected in the midst of the village. Its top is crowned with flowers, lower down it is twined with leaves and twigs, still lower with huge green branches. The girls dance round it, 
and at the same time a lad wrapped in leaves and called father may is led about in the small towns of the frankenwald mountains in northern bavaria on the second of may a walbur tree is erected before a tavern and a man dances round it enveloped in straw from head to foot in such a way that the ears of corn unite above his head to form a crown he is called the walbur and used to be led in procession through the streets which were adorned with sprigs of birch Amongst the Slavs of Corinthia, on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April, the young people deck with flowers and garlands, a tree which has been felled on the eve of the festival. The tree is then carried in procession, accompanied with music and joyful acclamations. The chief figure in the procession being the Green George, a young fellow clad from head to foot in green birch branches. At the close of the ceremonies, the Green George, that is an effigy of him, is thrown into the water. It is the aim of the lad who acts Green George to step out of his leafy envelope and substitute the effigy, so adroitly that no one shall perceive the change. In many places, however, the lad himself who plays the part of Green George is ducked in a river or pond, with the express intention of thus ensuring rain to make the fields and meadows green in summer. In some places the cattle are crowned and driven from their stalls to the accompaniment of a song. Green George we bring, Green George we accompany. May he feed our herds well, if not to the water with him. Here we see that the same powers of making rain and fostering the cattle, which are ascribed to the tree spirit, regarded as incorporate in the tree, are also attributed to the tree spirit represented by a living man. Among the gypsies of Transylvania and Romania, the festival of Green George is the chief celebration of spring. Some of them keep it on Easter Monday, others on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April. On the eve of the festival, a young willow tree is cut down, adorned with garlands and leaves, and set up in the ground. Women with child place one of their garments under the tree, and leave it there overnight. If next morning they find a leaf of the tree lying on the garment, they know that their delivery will be easy. Sick and old people go to the tree in the evening, spit on it thrice, and say, You will soon die, but let us live. Next morning, the gypsies gather about the willow. The chief figure of the festival is Green George, a lad who is concealed from top to toe in green leaves and blossoms. He throws a few handfuls of grass to the beasts of the tribe in order that they may have no lack of fodder throughout the year. Then he takes three iron nails, which have lain for three days and nights in water, and knocks them into the willow, after which he pulls them out and flings them into the running stream to propitiate the water spirits. Finally, a pretense is made of throwing Green George into the water, but in fact it is only a puppet made of branches and leaves, which is ducked in the stream. In this version of the custom, the powers of granting an easy delivery to women and of communicating vital energy to the sick and old are clearly ascribed to the willow. While Green George, the human double of the tree, bestows food on the cattle and further ensures the favor of the water spirits by putting them in direct communication with the tree. Without citing more examples to the same effect, we may sum up the results of the preceding pages in the words of Manhart. The customs quoted suffice to establish with certainty the conclusion that in these spring processions, the spirit of vegetation is often represented both by the may tree and in addition by a man dressed in green leaves or flowers or by a girl similarly adorned. It is the same spirit which animates the tree and is active in the inferior plants, and which we have recognized in the may tree and the harvest may. Quite consistently, the spirit is also supposed to manifest his presence in the first flower of spring, and reveals himself both in a girl representing a may rose, and also as giver of harvest. In the person of the Walber, the procession with this representative of the divinity was supposed to produce the same beneficial effects on the fowls, the fruit trees, and the crops as the presence of the deity himself. In other words, the bummer was regarded not as an image, but as an actual representative of the spirit vegetation. Hence, the wish expressed by the attendants on the May Rose and the May Tree, that those who refuse them gifts of eggs, bacon, and so forth, may have no share in the blessings which it is in the power of the itinerant spirit to bestow. We may conclude that these begging processions with May Trees or May Boughs from door to door, bring the May or the Summer, had everywhere originally a serious and, so to speak, sacramental significance. People really believed that the god of growth was present unseen in the bow. By the procession, he was brought to each house to bestow his blessing. The names May, 
Father May, May Lady, Queen of the May, by which the anthropomorphic spirit of vegetation is often denoted, show that the idea of the spirit of vegetation is blent with a personification of the season at which his powers are most strikingly manifested. So far, we have seen that the tree spirit or the spirit of vegetation in general is represented in either vegetable form alone, as by a tree, bough, or flower, or in vegetable and human form simultaneously, as by a tree, bough, or flower in combination with a puppet or a living person. It remains to show that the representation of him by a tree, bough, or flower is sometimes entirely dropped, while the representation of him by a living person remains. In this case, the representative character of the person is generally marked by dressing him or her in leaves or flowers. Sometimes, too, it is indicated by the name he or she bears. Thus, in some parts of Russia, on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April, a youth is dressed out, like our Jack in the Green, with leaves and flowers. The Slovenes call him the Green George. Holding a lighted torch in one hand and a pie in the other, he goes out to the cornfields, followed by girls singing appropriate songs. A circle of brushwood is next lighted, in the middle of which is set the pie. All who take part in the ceremony, then, sit down around the fire and divide the pie among them. In this custom, the green George dressed in leaves and flowers is plainly identical with the similarly disguised green George, who is associated with a tree in the Corinthian, Transylvanian, and Romanian customs observed on the same day. Again, we saw that in Russia, at Whitsuntide, a birch tree is dressed in women's clothes and set up in the house. Clearly equivalent to this is the custom observed on Whit Monday by Russian girls in the district of Pinsk. They choose the prettiest of their number, envelop her in a mass of foliage taken from the birch trees and maples, and carry her about through the village. In Rula, as soon as the trees begin to grow green in spring, the children assemble on a Sunday and go out into the woods, where they choose one of their playmates to be the little leaf man. They break branches from the trees and twine them about the child till only his shoes peep out from the leafy mantle. Holes are made in it for him to see through, and two of the children lead the little leaf man that he may not stumble or fall. Singing and dancing, they take him from house to house, asking for gifts of food such as eggs, cream, sausages, and cakes. Lastly, they sprinkle the leaf man with water and feast on the food they have collected. In the Fricktal, Switzerland, at Whitsuntide, boys go out into a wood and swathe one of their number in leafy boughs. He is called the Whitsuntide Lout, and being mounted on horseback with green branch in his hand, he is led back into the village. At the village well, a halt is called, and the leaf-clad lout is dismounted and ducked in the trough. Thereby, he acquires the right of sprinkling water on everybody, and he exercises the right especially on girls and street urchins. The urchins march before him in bands, begging him to give them a Whitsuntide wedding. In England, the best-known example of these leaf-clad murmurers is the Jack in the Green, a chimney sweeper who walks encased in a pyramidal framework of wicker work, which is covered with holly and ivy and surmounted by a crown of flowers and ribbons. Thus arrayed, he dances on May Day at the head of the troop of chimney sweeps who collect pence. In Fricktal, a similar frame of basket work is called the Whitsuntide Basket. As soon as the trees begin to bud, a spot is chosen in the wood, and here in the village lads make the frame with all secrecy, lest others should forestall them. Leafy branches are twined round two hoops, one of which rests on the shoulders of the wearer, the other encircles his claves. Holes are made for his eyes and mouth, and a large nosegay crowns the hole. In this disguise he appears suddenly in the village at the hour of vespers, preceded by three boys blowing on horns made of willow bark. The great object of his supporters is to set up the Whitsuntide basket on the village well, and to keep it and him there, despite the efforts of the lads from neighboring villages who seek to carry off the Whitsuntide basket and set it up on their own well. In the class of cases of which the foregoing are specimens, it is obvious that the leaf-clad person who is led about is equivalent to the May-tree, Maybow or Maydal, which is carried from house to house by children begging. Both are representatives of the beneficent spirit of vegetation, whose visit to the house is recompensed by a present of money or food. Often the leaf-clad person who represents the spirit of vegetation is known as the king or the queen. Thus, for example, he or she is called the May King, Whitsuntide King, Queen of May, and so on. 
These titles, as Manhart observes, imply that the spirit in corporate in vegetation is a ruler whose creative power extends far and wide. In a village near Salzweedle, a may tree is set up at Whitsuntide, and the boys race to it. He who reaches it first is king, a garland of flowers is put around his neck, and in his hand he carries a may bush, with which, as the procession moves along, he sweeps away the dew. At each house they sing a song, wishing the inmates good luck, referring to the black cow in the stall milking white milk, black hen on the nest laying white eggs, and begging a gift of eggs, bacon, and so on. At the village of Elgoth, in Silesia, a ceremony called the King's Race is observed at Whitsuntide. A pole with a cloth tied to it is set up in the meadow, and the young men ride past it on horseback, each trying to snatch away the cloth as he gallops by. The one who succeeds in carrying it off and dipping it in the neighboring odor is proclaimed king. Here the pole is clearly a substitute for a may tree. In some villages of Brunswick at Whitsuntide, a may king is completely enveloped in a may bush. In some parts of Thuringen, also they have a may king at Whitsuntide, but he is dressed up rather differently. A frame of wood is made in which a man can stand. It is completely covered with birch boughs and is surmounted by a crown of birch and flowers, in which a bell is fastened. This frame is placed in the wood and the May King gets into it. The rest go out and look for him, and when they have found him, they lead him back into the village to the magistrate and clergyman and others who have to guess who is in the virgurous frame. If they guess wrong, the May King rings his bell by shaking his head, and a forfeit of beer or the like must be paid by the unsuccessful guesser. At Warstead, the boys at Whitsuntide choose by lot a king and high steward. The latter is completely concealed in a may bush, wears a wooden crown, wreathen with flowers, and carries a wooden sword. The king, on the other hand, is only distinguished by a nosegay in his cap, and a reed with a red ribbon tied to it in his hand. They beg for eggs from house to house, threatening that, where none are given, none will be laid by the hens throughout the year. In this custom, the high steward appears for some reason to have usurped the insignia of the king. At Hildesheim, five or six young fellows go about on the afternoon of Whit Monday, cracking long whips in measured time and collecting eggs from the houses. The chief person of the band is the Leaf King, a lad swathed so completely in birchen twigs that nothing of him can be seen but his feet. A huge headdress of birchen twigs adds to his apparent stature. In his hand he carries a long crook, with which he tries to catch stray dogs and children. In some parts of Bohemia, on Whit Monday, the young fellows disguise themselves in tall caps of birch bark adorned with flowers. One of them is dressed as a king and dragged on a sledge to the village green, and if on the way they pass a pool, the sledge is always overturned into it. Arrived at the green, they gather round the king. The crier jumps on a stone or climbs up a tree and recites lampoons about each house and its inmates. Afterwards, the disguises of bark are stripped off, and they go about the village in holiday attire, carrying a may tree and begging. Cakes, eggs, and corn are sometimes given them. At Grosvargula, near Langensalza, in the 18th century, a grass king used to be led about in procession at Whitsuntide. He was encased in a pyramid of popular branches, the top of which was adorned with a royal crown of branches and flowers. He rode on horseback with the leafy pyramid over him, so that its lower end touched the ground, and an opening was left in it only for his face. Surrounded by a cavalcade of young fellows, he rode in procession to the town hall, the parsonage, and so on, where they all got a drink of beer. Then, under the seven lindens of the neighboring Sommerberg, the grass king was stripped of his green casing. The crown was handed to the mayor, and the branches were struck in the flax fields in order to make the flax grow tall. In this last trait, the fertilizing influence ascribed to the representative of the tree spirit comes out clearly in the neighborhood of Pilsen, Bohemia, a conical hut of green branches without any door is erected at Whitsuntide in the midst of the village. To this hut rides a troop of village lads with a king at their head. He wears a sword at his side and a sugar loaf hat of rushes on his head. In his train are a judge, a crier, and a personage called the frog flayer or hangman. This last is a sort of ragged Mary Andrew, wearing a rusty old sword and bestriding a sorry hack. On reaching the hut, the crier dismounts and goes round it, looking for a door. 
Finding none, he says, ah, this is perhaps an enchanted castle. The witches creep through the leaves and need no door. At last, he draws his sword and hews his way into the hut, where there is a chair on which he seats himself and proceeds to criticize and rhyme the girls, farmers, and farm servants of the neighborhood. When this is over, the frog flayer steps forward, and after exhibiting a cage with frogs in it, he sets up a gallows on which he hangs the frogs in a row. In the neighborhood of Place, the ceremony differs in some points. The king and his soldiers are completely clad in bark, adorned with flowers and ribbons. They all carry swords and ride horses, which are gay with green branches and flowers. While the village dames and girls are being criticized at the arbor, a frog is secretly pinched and poked by the crier till it quacks. Sentence of death is passed on the frog by the king. The hangman beheads it and flings the bleeding body among the spectators. Lastly, the king is driven from the hut and pursued by the soldiers. The pinching and beheading of the frog are doubtless, as Manhart observes, a rain charm. We have seen that some Indians of the Orinoco beat frogs for the express purpose of producing rain, and that killing a frog is a European rain charm. Often the spirit of vegetation in spring is represented by a queen instead of a king. In the neighborhood of Lipchowick, Bohemia, on the fourth Sunday in Lent, girls dressed in white and wearing the first spring flowers as violets and daisies in their hair lead about the village girl who is called the queen and is crowned with flowers. During the procession, which is conducted with great solemnity, none of the girls may stand still but must keep whirling round continually and singing. In every house, the queen announces the arrival of spring and wishes the inmates good luck and blessings, for which she receives presents. In German Hungary, the girls choose the prettiest girl to be their Whitsuntide queen, fasten a towering wreath on her brow, and carry her singing through the streets. At every house they stop, sing old ballads, and receive presents. In the southeast of Ireland, on May Day, the prettiest girl used to be chosen queen of the district for twelve months. She was crowned with wildflowers, feasting, dancing, and rustic sports followed, and were closed by a grand procession in the evening. During her year of office, she presided over rural gatherings of young people at dances and merrymakings. If she married before next May Day, her authority was at an end, but her successor was not elected till the day came round. The May Queen is common in France and familiar in England. Again, the spirit of vegetation is sometimes represented by a king and queen, a lord and lady, or a bridegroom and bride. Here again, the parallelism holds between the anthropomorphic and the vegetable representation of the tree spirit. For we have seen above that trees are sometimes married to each other. At Hulford in South Warwickshire, the children go from house to house on May Day, walking two and two in procession, and headed by the king and queen. Two boys carry a maypole, some six or seven feet high, which is covered with flowers and greenery. Fastened to it near the top are two crossbars at right angles to each other. These are also decked with flowers, and from the ends of the bars hang hoops similarly adorned. At the houses, the children sing May songs and receive money, which is used to provide tea for them at the schoolhouse in the afternoon. In a Bohemian village near Konigratz, on Whit Monday, the children play the king's game, at which the king and queen march about under a canopy, the queen wearing a garland, and the youngest girl carrying two wreaths on a plate behind them. They are attended by boys and girls called groomsmen and bridesmaids, and they go from house to house collecting gifts. A regular feature in the popular celebration of Whitsuntide in Silesia used to be, and to some extent still is, the contest for the kingship. This contest took various forms, but the mark or goal was generally the may tree or maypole. Sometimes the youth who succeeded in climbing the smooth pole and bringing down the prize was proclaimed the Whitsuntide king and his sweetheart, the Whitsuntide bride. Afterwards, the king, carrying the maybush, repaired with the rest of the company to the alehouse, where a dance and feast ended the merrymaking. Often the young farmers and laborers raced on horseback to the maypole, which was adorned with flowers, ribbons, and a crown. He who first reached the pole was the Whitsuntide king, and the rest had to obey his orders for that day. The worst rider became the clown. At the maytree all dismounted and hoisted the king on their shoulders. He nimbly swarmed up the pole and brought down the maybush and the crown, which had been fastened to the top. 
Meanwhile, the clown hurried to the alehouse and proceeded to bolt 30 rolls of bread and to swig four quart bottles of brandy with the utmost possible dispatch. He was followed by the king, who bore the maybush and crown at the head of the company. If on their arrival the clown had already disposed of the rolls and the brandy and greeted the king with a speech and a glass of beer, his score was paid by the king. Otherwise, he had to settle it himself. After church time, the stately procession wound through the village. At the head of it rode the king, decked with flowers and carrying the maybush. Next came the clown, with his clothes turned inside out, a great flaxen beard on his chain, and the Whitsuntide crown on his head. Two riders disguised as guards followed. The procession drew up before every farmyard. The two guards dismounted, shut the clown into the house, and claimed a contribution from the housewife to buy soap with which to wash the clown's beard. Custom allowed them to carry off any victuals, which were not under lock and key. Last of all, they came to the house in which the king's sweetheart lived. She was greeted as Whitsuntide Queen and received suitable presents. To wit, a many-colored sash, a cloth, and an apron. The king got as a prize a vest, a neckcloth, and so forth, and had the right of setting up the maybush or Whitsuntide tree before his master's yard, where it remained as an honorable token till the same day next year. Finally, the procession took its way to the tavern, where the king and queen opened the dance. Sometimes the Whitsuntide king and queen succeeded to office in a different way. A man of straw, as large as life and crowned with a red cap, was conveyed in a cart, between two men armed and disguised as guards, to a place where a mock court was waiting to try him. A great crowd followed the cart. After a formal trial, the straw man was condemned to death and fastened to a stake on the execution ground. The young men, with bandaged eyes, tried to stab him with a spear. He who succeeded became king, and his sweetheart queen. The straw man was known as the Goliath. In a parish of Denmark, it used to be the custom at Whitsuntide to dress up a little girl as the Whitsun bride and a little boy as her groom. She was decked in all the finery of a grown-up bride and wore a crown of the freshest flowers of spring on her head. Her groom was as gay as flowers, ribbons, and knots could make him. The other children adorned themselves as best they could with the yellow flowers of the Trollius and Keltha. Then they went in a great state from farmhouse to farmhouse, two little girls walking at the head of the procession as bridesmaids, and six or eight outriders galloping ahead on hobby horses to announce their coming. Contributions of eggs, butter, loaves, cream, coffee, sugar, and tallow candles were received and conveyed away in baskets. When they had made the round of the farms, some of the farmers' wives helped to arrange the wedding feast, and the children danced merrily in clogs on the stamped clay floor. All the sun rose, and the birds began to sing. All this is now a thing of the past. Only the old folks still remember the little Whitson bride and her mimic pomp. We have seen that in Sweden the ceremonies associated elsewhere with May Day or Whitsuntide commonly take place at midsummer. Accordingly, we find that in some parts of the Swedish province of Bleckinge they still choose a midsummer's bride to whom the church coronet is occasionally lent. The girl selects for herself a bridegroom, and a collection is made for the pair, who for the time being are looked on as man and wife. The other youths also choose each his bride. A similar ceremony seems to be still kept up in Norway. In the neighborhood of Briancon, Dauphiné, on May Day, the lads wrap up in green leaves a young fellow whose sweetheart has deserted him or married another. He lies down on the ground and feigns to be asleep. Then a girl who likes him and would marry him comes and wakes him, and raising him up offers him her arm and a flag. So they go to the alehouse, where the pair lead off the dancing but they must marry within the year or they are treated as old bachelor and old maid and are debarred the company of the young folks the lad is called the bridegroom of the month of may in the alehouse he puts off his garment of leaves out of which mixed with flowers his partner in the dance makes a nosegay and wears it at her breast next day when he leads her again to the alehouse like this is a russian custom observed in the district of norekta on the thursday before whitsunday the girls go out into a birch wood, wind a girdle or a band round a stately birch, twist its lower branches into a wreath, and kiss each other in pairs through the wreath. 
The girls who kiss through the wreath call each other gossips. Then one of the girls steps forward and mimicking a drunken man, flings herself on the ground, rolls on the grass, and feigns to fall fast asleep. Another girl wakens the pretend sleeper and kisses him. Then the whole bevy trips, singing through the wood to twine garlands, which they throw into the water. In the fate of the garlands floating on the stream, they read their own. Here the part of the sleeper was probably at one time played by a lad. In these French and Russian customs, we have a forsaken bridegroom in the following a forsaken bride. On Shrove Tuesday, the Slovenes of Oberkrain drag a straw puppet with joyous cries up and down the village. Then they throw it into the water or burn it, and from the height of the flames they judge of the abundance of the next harvest. The noisy crew is followed by a female masker, who drags a great board by a string and gives out that she is a forsaken bride. Viewed in the light of what has gone before, the awakening of the forsaken sleeper in these ceremonies probably represents the revival of vegetation in spring, but it is not easy to assign their respective parts to the forsaken bridegroom and to the girl who wakes him from his slumber. Is the sleeper the leafless forest or the bare earth of winter? Is the girl who awakens him the fresh verdure or the genial sunshine of spring? It is hardly possible on the evidence before us to answer these questions. In the highlands of Scotland, the revival of vegetation in spring used to be graphically represented on St. Bride's Day, the 1st of February. Thus, in the Hebrides, the mistress and the servants of each family take a sheaf of oats and dress it up in women's apparel, put it in a large basket, and lay a wooden club by it, and this they call Brid's bed. And then the mistress and servants cry three times, Brid is come, Brid is welcome. This they do just before going to bed. And when they rise in the morning, they look amongst the ashes, expecting to see the impression of Brid's club there, which if they do, they reckon it a true presage of a good crop and prosperous year, and the contrary they take as an ill omen. The same custom is described by another witness thus, Upon the night before Candlemas, it is usual to make a bed with corn and hay, over which some blankets are laid, in a part of the house near the door. When it is ready, a person goes out and repeats three times, Bridget, Bridget, come in, thy bed is ready. One or more candles are left burning near it all night. Similarly, on the Isle of Man, on the eve of the first February, a festival was formerly kept, called, in the Manx language, Lal Briche, in honor of the Irish lady who went over to the Isle of Man to receive the veil from St. Malgold. The custom was to gather a bundle of green rushes, and standing with them in the hand on the threshold of the door, to invite the holy St. Bridget to come and lodge with them that night. In the Manx language, the invitation ran thus, Brede, brede, targis thy thee, tardin thy aims night. Fashol gi yen dores da brede, as ig da brede a hate stray. In English, Bridget, Bridget, come to my house, come to my house tonight. Open the door for Bridget, and let Bridget come in. After these words were repeated, the rushes were strewn on the floor by way of a carpet, or bed for St. Bridget. A custom very similar to this was also observed in some of the out-isles of the ancient kingdom of man. In these Manx and Highland ceremonies, it is obvious that St. Bride or St. Bridget is an old heathen goddess of fertility disguised in a threadbare Christian cloak. Probably she is no other than Bridget, the Celtic goddess of fire and apparently of the crops. Often the marriage of the spirit of vegetation in spring, though not directly represented, is implied by naming the human representative of the spirit, the bride, and dressing her in wedding attire. Thus, in some villages of Altmark at Whitsuntide, while the boys go about carrying a may tree or leading a boy enveloped in leaves and flowers, the girls lead about the may bride, a girl dressed as a bride with a great nosegay in her hair. They go from house to house, the may bride singing a song in which she asks for a present and tells the inmates of each house that if they give her something, they will themselves have something the whole year through. But if they give her nothing, they will themselves have nothing. In some parts of Westphalia, Two girls led a flower-crowned girl called the Whitsuntide Bride from door to door, singing a song in which they ask for eggs. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. 
You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Coven Cast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, coven, blessed be.